on the question of the coup and responsibility for the coup, um, the British were, of course, extremely important because it was their dispute with Iran over, over oil. Um, the British then exerted a considerable amount of influence over the United States. Um, the U.S. was not um, top dog in the Middle East. It was coming into that role, but it was this extraordinary period of transition with the Brits on the way down and the U.S. on the way up. And um, there was still a certain amount of respect with regard to British experience and that sort of thing. So when the Brits said to the Americans that this guy Mossadegh is going to let the communists in and he's being propped up by the communists, and America was in um, the throes of um, a paranoia of its own with regard to communism, well, there were receptive ears, particularly with the advent of the Eisenhower administration. Um, so that created a, a, an atmosphere in which um, a coup could be contemplated. The British couldn't mount the coup because they were out of the country. They'd been expelled by Mossadegh. So operationally, it would have to be um, mounted by the Americans. Um, it was a time when, um, and I think it's from this that another extraordinary, extraordinarily prevalent assumption in Iran, which is that the Brits um, pull the strings um, where this comes from. In this instance, they did, to a certain extent, pull the strings. Mm -hmm. And after that, of course, the Americans took their own decisions. And when the Brits um, saw the success of the coup, um, I'm sure that a lot of them, and a lot of them in the oil company, thought that it would be a return to status quo ante. But of course, it wasn't. The Americans came in, um, both in the form of their own oil companies, but also as a, as a far more assertive foreign power. And of course, the relationship between America and the Shah is well documented, and the, and the Brits were slowly edged to a much more peripheral position. There has been, sorry, I'm, I'm going to go tackle this other point, which mm -hmm. is extremely important. The, the, the question of, of whether or not the events of, uh, of August 1953 are, were a, a spontaneous uprising, uh, a combination of, of local actors with a bit of foreign help, or, or how it worked. There has and there will always be a camp that says this was a, an uprising and that Mossadegh had gone too far with a lot of his measures. Some of them were becoming anti-democratic. People were scared of the communists and the two-day party who, uh, who seemed to be gaining in, in, in power and influence. Um, and that the scenes that were seen on the streets of, um, August, the 20th, or of August the 19th were um, a spontaneous uprising. Nothing that I've seen in, in the quite extensive um, readings that I've done, in whatever language, has, mm -hmm. has corroborated that. The people who, who put forward this story uh, tend to be um, those who feel a sentimental attachment to the monarch or the, to the institution of the monarchy, or those who benefited most, um, uh, most uh, obviously from the events and would like to cast them in a more legitimate light. It was a military coup sponsored, organized by foreigners. Yeah. I would say yeah. I would say that this parallel exists um, and that there are there are certain lessons to be drawn. Um, but at the same time one has to recognize that Mossadegh is not Ahmadinejad. Mm -hmm. Oil is not is not centrifuges. But I think that in the ability of the Islamic Republic to appeal to the nationalist sentiments of the people, um, often a similar kind of imagery mm -hmm. has been used. And the idea that something is not negotiable because it represents honor or dignity is something that we see back in the early 1950s. I don't think it's unique to Iran at all. I think it's common to a lot of countries that have seen resources um, or uh, um, a certain potential um, obscured or affected by outside powers. And it's very difficult for us um, living and growing up in countries that have not suffered that or have not suffered that for a very long time to appreciate how it is that oil could possibly equal dignity. But um, 
it's definitely the case that I think, yes, it was um, when Roosevelt, the Kim Roosevelt, mm -hmm. who basically orchestrated the coup, the CIA agent, um, brought out his book, Counter Coup, which is a very misleading title, mm -hmm. in 1980. There was this wonderful coincidence of, of events because he wanted to bring it out, but the hostage crisis was underway, and should he bring it out? And then, and then MI6 learned that they were brought up in his account, and there was, they were going to um, raise a fuss. So instead of saying MI6, he just used the oil company, put in the oil company instead of MI6 to sort of, um, as a shorthand for British imperial interests. And then the company got angry, and then they had to pulp a whole load of, of, of copies. But eventually it did come out, this, this very entertaining but pretty slightly unreliable account of the coup. And Thomas Powers wrote an excellent review in The Nation about this, in which he went in and he unpacked all this in 1980. He said, look at what happened in, in 1953. And ultimately, and I paraphrase, paraphrase, he said that the Iranians didn't like it, that someone could just waltz in and topple their government with a few dollars here and not knowing a word of the language and then just waltz off and then, well, it happened again in, in other countries and it became enshrined as a, as a, as a part of, of American policy. This idea of a casual coup with a few dollars is highly humiliating for a, for a proud people. All people are proud and, you know, it's, it's just a humiliating thing to recall and remember. And that was a wonderful phrase that Powers used. He summed, he summed it up so well. And nowadays, you see this. We were discussing Trita Parsi's book about mm. the, um, the relationship between Obama and, and the Iranians. And how the, at the beginning of that book, Trita talks about you know, the idea of respect. The Iranians are always insisting on respect, and the American officials scratching their heads. Well, fine, but what does actually that mean? What actually do they want? Yeah. But this idea of respect, it, it conjures all sorts of, it conjures an idea of two equals sitting opposite a table and you saying to me, right, well, you know, we have a duty to our friends in Israel. Um, and we saying, yes, but we have a duty to honor um, a general principle, which is that the Middle East should not have nuclear weapons. And you can't say, well, you're not allowed to talk about that, whereas we're allowed to talk about that. That's disrespect. That's, that's an in inequality in the, in the parameters of the discussion. So I think, yes, it needs, if I may just say one other thing, which, mm -hmm. which comes out of this. And the, if, if American officials have a problem you know, working out what this word respect means or what exactly the Iranians are trying to get at. The only way that they can understand is by spending time with the Iranians, is by having a relationship, is by having a kebab with them and chilling out and mm -hmm. actually working out what, these, what makes these people think. And then you understand each other. And then when they say respect, oh, we know what they mean by that. What they mean is X, Y, and Z. Right. But when you don't, and your relationship is conducted but either by megaphone or through notes um, passed from hand to hand, then it becomes very difficult and you, you're into, the, you're into the, uh, a kind of very complicated interpretation and exege ex whatever the word is, <laughs> <laughs> of, of, of what the other person is trying to say. Uh, the Iranians will meet with the P5 plus one, including the United States, in Baghdad. Uh, for the second round of this new, newly revitalized talk on their nuclear program. Given what you've just said, um, this lack of interaction over more than three decades now, do these talks, do you have any optimism? I'm obliged to have optimism. Okay. <laughs> I fervently hope that it, that it works. I mm. think that um, anyone who's interested in a in a slightly saner world mm -hmm. must hope that it works and hope that the people who are conducting these negotiations are up to the task. I do think that it will be a long process and that it will involve um, endless confidence building measures to, to, to in some way offset the, the, this extraordinary 
accumulation of ill will that has mm. taken place basically since, well, since 2003, but even before that, but since 2003, it's really acquired this momentum of its own that has been very, very difficult to stop. And well, we find ourselves in the position where the Iranians were clearly spooked at some, to some degree by talk of war, and the Americans were also clearly spooked to some degree by talk of war. And we now find themselves, um, we, we find them forced together um, in an attempt to, to try and, uh, and avoid an, a further escalation. I, I am, I am, I, I do permit myself a, a degree of optimism. <coughs> okay. We'll invite you back after and see, <laughs> see how you did.